This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. All right, we've got some sponsors for the pod now. Wait, what? Every link you need for the things we talk about here is at artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors. First up, books. If you're into this podcast... Odds are you're probably a reader. We've got links to buy new books from bookshop.org and used books from alibris.com. And if you want to listen to your books, we recommend and use audible.com. It's great and the catalog is huge. All right. So if you're listening to this, you are online. Maybe you're very online. You probably have a website or are thinking of starting one. Maybe you want a website like artofdarkpod.com. We built that with WordPress, which is by far the most popular way to create websites. And the single best host for serious WordPress is WP Engine. I've personally used them for over a decade now, and I don't host my websites anywhere else. Go to artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors and click on the WP Engine link to learn more. Finally, the best way to support the show is at patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Get the bonus After Dark content for every episode, access to the book club, and more. Thanks for supporting Art of Darkness. And I, I don't think that was too painful. I think no, we did a pretty good job good. there. Yeah. Yeah, that sounded good. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate it. Okay, and welcome back to a very special Dark Room episode. Uh, I am Brad Kelly. This is my co-host, Kevin Kautzman. Kevin, how are you doing? I am, yeah, I am resting after the, well, actually, you know what? There's no rest. No, we keep no, going. No rest, we keep no rest grinding. Wicked or whatever Not at are. all. Three in a yeah. day, six hours on Hemingway yesterday. Yeah. And I know we've got another absolute thrill of an episode coming mm. up here. Be yeah, good. Ab- yeah, absolutely. We're very, we're very excited about this one. So for folks who know, who've been listening long to Art of Darkness, you know that we last fall-ish, August, I think, we did a in-depth core episode on Ernst Junge. That has proven to be a fairly popular episode. Um, it was illuminating for me. I hadn't been really familiar with him or his work. And, and, you know, sometimes we do that. We pick somebody who the name's kind of floating around and we're like, well, who is this person? Uh, and it ended up being a pretty interesting episode that took us into some, to some what I think were some uh, some interesting places. So um, to follow up on that with this darkroom episode, um, there is a new edition of Yunga's uh, On the Marble Cliffs out from New York Review Books, which is, uh, you know, for people who don't know, is is my, one of the better publishers out there right now. We don't want to start any, uh, any rivalries, but um, I'd put it in the top spot, perhaps. Um, and that is a represents a new a brand new translation by our first guest Tess Lewis and a foreword written by uh, Jesse E. Yuzhevska uh, Stevens uh, and <laughs> and uh, they're both with us here today. We're very excited to talk to you guys. Let me give a let me give a quick introduction to these folks just so um, you know our listeners know who we're talking to. Um, uh, Tess, uh, Tess's translations include work by uh, Peter Hanke, Walt, uh, Walter Benjamin, Klaus Mers. Uh, oh, man, I got all kinds of stuff to mispronounce on here, Kevin. Diagonal, <laughs> <Hans>, wunderbar. <laughs> Hans, Hans, like Magnus, torture. Hans, yeah, yeah. Hans Magnus, uh, Enzenberger, uh, Christine Ango, maybe, uh, Pascal Bruckner, and uh, Jean-Luc Benoziglio. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, she's been awarded grants from, uh, that is Tess Lewis, has been awarded grants from Penn USA, uh, Penn UK, and the NEA. Um, she's received a Max Gellinger translation uh, grant for her translation of uh, Philip, oh man, Philip Jacotet. I'm going to just assume that's right. Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up. Look at this. I'm doing okay. The ACFNY Translation Prize and the 2017 Penn's Trans- Pen Translation Prize for her translation of the novel Angel Angel of Oblivion by the Austrian writer Maga Hatterlap and a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. 
Um, I could go on. There is a lot here. She is um, a unquestionably a heavyweight in the world of translation. We're going to talk about that. This is very exciting. Coincidentally, a very recent uh, Dark Room episode, we had Ross Benjamin, who recently translated the um, the the Kafka Diaries into English. Also, you know, also a prominent translator um, from German into English. So this will be interesting. I think for people who enjoyed that episode, this is uh, maybe an extension of that in some ways. Um, Jesse is also with us. Jesse is the author of the novels, uh, The Exhibition of Persephone and The Visitors. Her fiction and criticism has been featured in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker Online, Foreign Policy, The Cut, The Paris Review, The Nation, Book Forum, Four Columns, and elsewhere. Um, she also teaches fiction at Columbia University. Um, and was a 2021 to 2022 Fulbright Scholar in Berlin, working on climate change narratives and political feasibility as mediated through literature and art. And we want to talk a little bit about some of that stuff, but mostly focus on the Junga work. Um, That's a good school. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, so I guess I'm not sure exactly where to start with this in terms of who you know could somebody maybe jesse either jesse or tess is could somebody just give us like a few sentence overview of what is on the marble cliffs either one of you guys who wants to i guess what do you think you want to go ahead jesse sure okay um yeah, so uh so thanks so much for having us um of course yeah thank i you think for we're we're here. Yeah, I think that um, Tess and I have also been really interested in um, the responses that uh, that have, you know, come out of this translation and, and sort of uh, reintroducing uh, Junger in, in some ways. Um, so On the Marble Cliffs is Junger's uh, most famous novel published in 1939. Um, that date is significant uh, because it can in many ways um, and and today and, and was received as um, a, a denunciation of the rise of the of the Nazi party. Um, so even though Junger is associated with the conservative revolution in the Weimar years, even though he um, himself uh, had um, fascist leanings was sort of, you know, here in um, kind of on again, off again uh, in um, the during the Weimar years and sort of touch and go with the rise of the Nazi party, ultimately um, doesn't join uh, and writes this novel, which um, is an allegory for a kind of, um, you know, Mediterranean paradise with uh, different realms, the marble cliffs, um, the countryside, and then uh, the, the seaside, and then the forest where um, in Tessa's translation, um, the head forester resides uh, and who is um, wreaking havoc across this, you know, Elysian realm. Um, and I think that sort of gets us started with just some of the allegorical notes um, and the kind of um, otherworldly, the world building and some even magical elements uh, to the allegory that, that Younger wrote. Yeah, no, thanks. I think that's great. Yeah, that was actually one aspect I was... Um... I guess I sort of anticipated to some degree, but was surprised and impressed by was the extent of the what we now call world building. I don't know if people even had that term back in back in Yunga's day uh, writing this, but but uh, it seemed very carefully thought about thought about fairly original. Um, I don't really know the world he puts together. Um, all the elements are familiar, but it's it's put together in a way that I, I don't know that I have a very ready readily at hand comparison to another book i was i was actually um from a writer's perspective i was just impressed by the world that he managed to construct with fairly at times um not very labored brush strokes so um yeah yeah i think that's a good aspect to highlight um well some people have suggested that the one of the closest comparisons is tolkien's book in terms of world building without I mean, there's some magical elements, but you don't mm. get wizards and things, um, right? Right. Or elves, right. but it's yeah. it's definitely the creation of a of you know where a collage of different mythologies coming together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that, that comes through, and I actually was kind of thinking of Tolkien. It's sort of like, uh, yeah, Tolkien gets this. Uh, 
everything now seems a little tropey in Tolkien, but that's because he sort of invented some of the tropes. You know, it's one of those situations you're like, ah, this is old hat. Everybody does this. Yeah, it's because they got it from Tolkien. But um, but um, yeah, but but Junger is really do, doing an impressive job. Tess, let me kind of throw it to you. Translating this, how we, might you characterize Junger's language, his his style? What what makes it difficult? What makes it interesting to you as a project? Um, well, Junger is fascinating in that he, you know, he lived to 102. He died in, in 1998, but he was born in 1895. So he lived through all these cataclysmic events. He also lived through, you know, various uh, revolutions in the literary world. He was extremely well read very choosy about what he what he what he liked but he ranged widely in his reading um so one of the striking things about the marble cliff is how very different it is from his most famous book the storm of steel his war diaries from from the first world war which were um just an absolute runaway success and had admirers across the board from you know the the left to the right and everything in between um pro-war people and anti-war people so the marble cliffs comes along um it was written within a matter of weeks in 1939 and he part of his his project in creating this alternate universe was to was to, to have his language and style do a lot of the heavy lifting. So it is a very florid, um, uh, meandering, um, abstract kind of language that alternates with very vivid, precise imagery. So you get great evocations of landscapes, of botany, of different animals um, combined with these kind of Vatic abstractions and oracular pronouncements. Um, also, you know, he has a tendency to slip into aphorisms when he wants to sum up the, um, the action that has just taken place in the scene. So what was hard for me in, in translating this particular book was to, was to catch those that, that wide overarching abstract movement without making it sound, you know, inane or, or silly or sentimental, but, and also then in the sort of, um, in the closer observations of landscape or, or the animal world, it was to make it as vivid for the English reader as it is for the German. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can definitely see that. And of course, he's I mean, I, I don't claim to know all of the allegorical relationships, but uh, I, it does feel a, a book of this sort of brevity, you know, because it's what, 100 and just over 100 pages, 117 pages or something like that. Um, so fairly brief. But again, we say we're saying he built this world fairly um comprehensively in a way and believably and so it does strike me that you know all of these touches were probably important to him right how things look where th how things are positioned um and it does feel like i'm i'm really impressed that he wrote this in a couple of you said a few weeks yeah. um that's i'm sure it took you longer to do it than that and that's no <laughs> knock on your abilities but but i can't imagine that this was that you were able to translate this in a few weeks what can you tell us about the, uh, how this project came to you and then what it was you know that experience of working through it um well i don't i don't tend to to like to do retranslations i'd rather translate new things but this was a this was a very interesting challenge um the publisher of New York Review of Books approached me with it. I mean, I knew of it and I'd read it years ago because it's such an important um, work in, in the German literary tradition. He's such a central figure uh, in a lot of ways, both as a personality, as a diarist, and then also as a novelist, even though I'd argue that um, aside from the glass bees and all the, on the marble cliffs, his novels tend to be a bit dogmatic and repetitive. Um, so, you know, so one of the things I did was to go back and look at the original translation, Stuart Hood's, he did that in 1947. He was a British soldier um, who fought in the Second World War. And actually, he apparently uh, debriefed Younger 
Um, oh. And, you know, when they were when they were trying to figure out, when the Allied powers were trying to figure out who should be denazified and who shouldn't, it was Stuart Hood's job to speak with Jünger. And Jünger insisted that since he had never joined the Nazi party, he had there was nothing to denazify. Huh. Um, but, he, you know, that's another interesting aspect about Jünger is he really was a bit of a chameleon. And so... He never did join the Nazi parties, and he he actually uh, didn't care for them at all. Um, he felt that they were, he called them a party without metaphysics, and he thought they were too vulgar and brutal to, um, to, to, for him to want to associate with. Mm. But, um, but, you know, he, he did, he did have some pretty uh, dubious um, bedfellows. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> exonerate was, him completely, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, he's he is he wasn't quite as calculating as some of the other authors of the time. Um Hamito von Dorder, for example, who published, who wrote an absolute masterpiece about Vienna called The Strudelhof Steps, recently uh translated by Vincent Klink, also for New York Review. And um von Dorder is a fascinating, uh very sketchy figure, and he was married to a, his wife was Jewish, and he did join the Nazi Party early on when it was still illegal, mm. because he thought they could help him in his literary career. When he oh. realized that they couldn't, he quit the party before you know, right about the time that they were becoming legal. He's also just a complete sort of instinctive, um, you know, uh, whatever he he'll do the opposite just by, by instinct. He then mm. later did not help his wife. I mean, he really was was problematic um sounds like but it, i've yeah. gotten off on a tangent that doesn't <laughs> no that's me. okay that's all interesting i didn't know about the i i knew there was a previous translation i knew that name Stuart hood i did not realize that he was actually the guy who debriefed Jünger. that's a very interesting relationship yeah uh, it's a it's a small world and and so um and someone wrote you know about in the process of or the decision of whether or not or to what extent Jünger needed to be denazified there were various reports written on him. And I can't remember if Hood wrote this one or not, but there was one that said, um, you know, his writing is, is influential and important, but I don't think you really need to worry about him because he mm. doesn't really, you know, he's not going to be dangerous. He, he wasn't closely allied with the Nazis and his writing is contradictory or ambiguous enough that he doesn't really pose a real threat. Right, so, right. Uh, Jünger's refusal <laughs> to be denazified um, meant that he had difficulties getting published in the, you know, after the war for a decade or two, but then he was sort of, he was uh, rehabilitated or re-embraced by the, the German public and especially the French public. And he ended up getting every sort of civil and literary and military honor that was available. Um, yeah, I, th I think when we did our bite, we we found that later on in his life there was a French uh, postage stamp of Yunga yeah. apparently in the in the seventies or the eighties or something. So yeah, very interesting that he ends up sort of celebrated there. Oh, that's that's fascinating. Well, he was posted in occupied Paris and um, was you know it's not clear um, how active he was um, helping the French or those French writers and um, uh, personalities, even uh, some Jews in hiding, how much he helped, actively helped them, um, you know, escape or dodge bad consequences. But he, he, he did, um, well, he was associating with some of the, um, some of the Vichy people. He was also, you know, helping, you know, anecdotally, anecdotal evidence that he was helping Jews get visas when he was censoring the German soldiers' letters, and they wrote things that were critical of the war effort. Instead of reporting them, he burned the letters and would let the soldier know, look, I, I helped you this time, but I I won't necessarily be able to do it again, so you have to stop writing this kind of stuff. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't about to martyr himself, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Especially since he lost his son. Um, his son was, I believe, still at school at the time, and he was saying things against the Nazis, and he was reported. And so he had the choice of going to war or going to the front. And he mm -hmm. went to the front, and he died actually in Carrera on the Marble Cliffs in Italy. 
but it seems that it may have been an execution because there were two bullet holes in the back of his head. Oh, geez. So I don't, you know, was that quote unquote friendly fire or the enemy fire? I don't know. Right. And that's, um, a, syn- that's a synchronicity that would not have escaped Jung's observation. I yeah, imagine. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was. He felt it was very significant. Yeah. Um, um, Jesse, Jesse, if I can throw it to you, I, um, I, you wrote the forward to this book, and I thought it was I thought it was incredibly well done forward, um, really delicately handling. Well, how do you introduce this book and and, you know, the possibility that somebody who is reading it ha- is not familiar with you really at all? I know I know there are people who just read whatever New York Review books right. puts out. So right. I can imagine there's somebody who's just like, oh, there's a new one. I'll just read that. Um, and so forward is, I think, critical for that case and you did a great job i want to focus on one thing you said and maybe we can we can kind of use this to talk more broadly about the book um because i thought it was i thought it was very interesting i agreed with it and it was very well put you said um the most striking quality of on the marble cliffs is to me its stillness if fiction is the art of lending time to concepts and truths that seem to exist outside of time on the marble cliffs aims for just the opposite okay so Let me just think about that. If fiction is the art of lending time to concepts and truth that seem to exist outside of time, On the Marble Cliffs aims for just the opposite. So uh, very interesting. Can we talk about, are there parts, and I don't mean to put you on the spot in terms of like quizzing you on what's in this book, (laughs) but are there parts that that strike you particularly, aspects of the book that strike you is particularly um, relevant to that, to that quote? Yeah. Um, so, so just to start with the, it, it did feel really important to um, uh, be very precise in in this um, in this introduction because I think the curation around republishing Junger is um, is very important given um, some of his ambiguous politics, but also because you know he is such an important um, and influential stylist. Um, uh, amongst other writers of, of these times. So, so both both of these goals are important, um, both for the political and, and literary um, history that um, that comes into play with, with Junger. So it was really important to, um, uh, to um, be precise about the style with On the Marble Cliffs because Junger is also known so much as an esthete that if we're going to talk about politics, I think that there are, um, there are, ideological connections right to to the style that he uses um here um so to in and here I'm, I'm talking about the kind of stillness of this book um and in a way it seems it, it's it's published in 1939 as we as we said and it's capturing um this moment before <laughs> um or as the the nazis are sort of plunging europe into one of its darkest moments right um and i do think that that is kind of um you know Tess said that the it, it's not a especially plot driven book, but it's it's trying it's a nostalgic book. Mm. Um, it's written from the perspective of two brothers, so you have the collective we, which gives it this, um, which is also a very interesting choice that they're mourning really um, all of the natural beauty, all of the customs, um, the. Uh, the 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 flowers and, and wildlife. We have two brothers who are botanists, and on all of these traditions that will be lost to the head forester um, once once he wins, um, and which because that that the head forester's victory seems to them to be inevitable. And there there is um, one moment that that I was thinking of um, that I think captures that project in terms of in a way this this book is is capturing the stillness of that moment of horror before a great plunge. <laughs> um, and uh, in another way, you could also read this book as, um, you know, we're on the marble cliffs. Um, Junger is building himself a little bit of an ivory tower in which to protect all of those values that he holds dear, all of, you know, ideals of beauty, ideals of um, human dignity that he finds um, the, the Nazis to be desecrating. So there are these, there, there are both of these, of these goals. Um, and, and one moment that, uh, that comes to mind, um, the, the brothers are describing, I, I tried to, yeah, I found this quote here. Um, he's, he's describing the, the, the atmosphere as, as they're watching, um, 
from the marble cliffs, the, the head foresters rise and they say, um, it is said that when you fall in again in Tessa's really wonderful translation, because the tone is so important to this book, um, it is said that when you fall into the abyss, you see things with the utmost degree of clarity as through overcorrected lenses. Um, so in, in the head forester, they say, is the source of the sharpened vision. So, so I really think that this book, that that's a microcosm to me, that, that element, that part of the book, um, you know, we're, we're trying to capture that heightened clarity and that sense of stillness just before you fall into the abyss. Right, right. No, I, I, I love the way, and I hadn't thought about the, the, um, I actually have that exact sentence or the paragraph that sentence is in highlighted here. Um, there, I I hadn't really noticed the whole, the use of we, and you're right that this does grant it a certain kind of, um, it gives you a sort of intimacy and separation at the same time or something. Cause it's like the, we, is that me, the reader also like, where am I positioned um, it, relative to the brothers relative to what's happening below on the marble cliffs? Yeah. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Um, well, he's, I, I, it's also right. interesting that just even opening the book, he draws the reader into a sort of complicity by saying, you know, the first line is, you all know, and, and in German, it's you, the, the plural you, yeah. you all know the fierce melancholy that overcomes us, you know, the reader and, yeah. the, and the narrator at the memory of happy times. Mm. You know, I think- and he draws you into this, into this nostalgia, this melancholic nostalgia, um, and then takes it from there and sustains that, as Jesse said, with the, with the we. Yeah. Yeah. I think Even though that- Brother Otto never really says anything. Well, that was the other thing is Brother Otto has like no characteristics even really. Uh, not many anyway. Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting character. It's almost, he almost yeah. doesn't exist, but he's in every, on every page. Well, he's there to justify the we, you know, because I right. think it, you know, then it heightens that sense of loss. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing I no- noted about this and, and there's a, there's an aspect of this, like, utopianism you said Jung was locking himself up in this ivory tower and I think that's I think that's right as I was reading this and you know I'm sort of falling in love with the style of it I just like the sentences and much credit to you Tess for that I mean it's a it's a it's a just as a a aesthetic experience reading sentence a sentence it's quite enjoyable and enrapturing um but as I'm reading I'm thinking like this situation on the marble cliffs is completely untenable anyway like you can't what what is actually the uh and not to get too sort of pragmatic about it but like what is the engine of this lifestyle that you guys have there's no reason why you should be able to sustain this not to say that the head forester should wipe them out but there is this sense of like you can't you can't live like this this isn't how the world works and somebody somebody on the other end of the economic spectrum is being uh exploited for this lifestyle to happen because they're just sort of collecting these you know beautiful plant specimens i don't know it, it felt that actually felt to me uh, i can buy the um the magnifying glass that burns things and 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 makes them permanent in the ether and i can buy the snakes and i can buy all that but i sort of can't buy the um just daily economic realities of their situation, I guess. Maybe I'm too cynical. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. So well, I think I think ahead. that whole economic setup is really a reflection of Jünger's political views and, in a sense, a justification of them. So he was an absolutely convinced and unrepentant elitist, and a, he absolutely loathed and despised uh, liberal democracy. Mm-hmm. And so you've got these two brothers who are, you know, they're they're independently wealthy, although not all that wealthy, but somehow, you know, they can, they can go into retreat into a hermitage and have a, you know, some housekeeper and and do their studies without, you know, no visible means of support. Mm -hmm. But the reason that the Head Forrester and his rabble are overtaking this refined civilization is because the the workers, the people who do all the work and who are either being exploited or marginally exploiting others, you know, but basically producing the food and the goods and and whatnot, are 
letting the bonds that keep civilization together intact. And, mm -hmm. and so Jünger believed that society was stratified and there were people who at the top and there were people at the bottom. And so if you're the narrator with brother Otto and you're at the top, you, you know, the fact that you're spending all day classifying plants is more than enough to justify your mm -hmm. uh, existence of, of relative ease. And okay. it's the fault of the, of the, of the, plebeian masses who are not respecting traditional societies um, that, you know, that their society is going to have to, in his words, be plunged into the flames and reborn again, Phoenix-like. Right, right. Very interesting. Yeah, and it is, it, the, that elitist strain is interesting when you reflect on, Tess, what you were saying about why Jung's sort of top line reasons for not joining the Nazi party those are kind of elitist too it sounds like it's you guys are vulgar like this is it and i thought they were you know, he thought they were d class a right yeah. right yeah. which hmm, i don't i guess i don't have much else to say about that it's just very interesting to note that yeah well um, and, and certainly Junger is experiencing a kind of a resurgence in the the english-speaking world and mm -hmm. without a doubt there are some people who attach themselves to this side of his of his politics as well so well, it's a bit yeah. of a tricky uh tightrope <laughs> yeah that was sort of the next thing i wanted to move into was was uh, tess and jesse what do you guys make of there uh, have you noticed a um upswelling of attention for yunga and if you've noticed it, what do you make of it? What is it? What does it mean? What does it mean? If Yunga is more popular than ever, which I think might maybe not more popular than ever, but uh, certainly, um, certainly there seems to be a, a, a uh, resurgence in attention on him. What does that mean? Is that good? Yeah. Is that bad? <laughs> Either I mean, one of you guys, I, I guess. I think this speaks again to the importance of, um, you know, curation around a figure like this. Um, you know, Tess mentioned that Junger was really a, a chameleon and sort of a man of contradictions. So I think that he can be an interesting figure from, from really multiple different angles. Yes, he was an elitist, but he also had, you know, kind of overlap in some of his Weimar um, uh, so I think that we should say that at the moment in which uh, Gunger is writing in this Weimar area, um, era, um, you know, you have fascists, you have communists, you have liberal Democrats, it's, it, the Republic is unstable and it's really up for debate, you know, should we have <laughs> a, a democracy? And this is a, a raging debate and there are many, many voices. Um, and Junger is a prominent one on the, um, conservative conservative side. However, uh, there are so many contradictions that, you know, he has some overlap with communists. He has some overlap with fascists. He is above all um, really anti-liberal, anti you know, an anti-democrat at, at this time. But he's also um, first and foremost a soldier and um, a, a nationalist and um, a, a militarist. He's come out of the First World War, um, serving all four years, um, you know, gaining an officer rank, um, and really as a war hero, um, and as Tess mentioned, the author of this incredibly popular diary. So I think that today, <laughs> um, if you have, he, he is anti-capitalist as well. Um, so if you have anti-capitalist or anti-globalization um, leanings, you can find precedent for this in Jünger. If you have more nationalist leanings, if you are enthralled to ideas of honor that can be very male coded um, in their relation to military hierarchy, you can find precedent in, in Jünger. If you're interested in mysticism um, and in um, transcendence, Junger was one of the earliest experimenters with um, with of, LSD. with LSD and was writing about this and had an interest in drugs. So there are all of these, um, you know, in, insofar as we're also in a moment of um, political extremes. I think that rediscovering and reclaiming Junger can feel really tempting um, from really any of these um, perspectives. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Yeah, that's a great been... insight. That that's yeah. what I took from the episode as well because I came in knowing next to nothing when Brad covered Junger on the on the core episode that we did. So it was a real pleasure. Yeah, that, I think that's very insightful. Uh, and we do live in an, a very extreme time uh, right now. So 
And there is the whole aspect of, of technological warfare and, you know, uh, yeah. where the battlefield is now being, the battle is being fought remotely and he explores that in various ways and sees that as a degradation of the of military and, and soldier honor. I actually, I don't think that he's more popular than ever. It's He's one of these authors, it's kind of cyclical. He goes through these phases where he becomes, you know, the people, there's a great deal of interest and then he fades and then there's a great deal of interest. So, so rather than seeing it as a, you know, as a, as a parabola, I see it more as, you know, up and down. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting it, in he's, he never has uh, sort of fallen out of fashion in France. The French love him and always have, there's a big younger following all the time. I'm mm. not quite sure how to explain that other than it's a, it's a fundamentally, um, or it's a essentially elitist society. Their culture is very hierarchical and stratified, and so that appeals to mm. a certain um, a certain large contingent in the establishment. Mm. Um, but also in Germany, um, he goes in and out of fashion, and he's recently um, back. There's a, a recent upswell of interest in him. They've just reissued his complete diaries. Um, which can be uh, translated as irradiations. Um, I'm sorry, so ir ir irradiations or radiations? Radiations. Okay, interesting. Just, um, you know, um, rays or, you know, as in rays being emitted. So mm -hmm. it's um, not not as yeah. in X-ray, but as in, as in light. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, interesting. And and so they have this historical, critical, annotated edition, and there is a lot of interest and a lot of speculation about what does it um, in the German, in the German sort of among German talking heads, what does this mean? Is there a reevaluation of what it of what masculinity is in Germany going on? You know, and and so it's you know it's uh, funny or rather quite intriguing to watch what pockets of interest in Jünger flare up. And how they're either tried, how treat people try to explain them or explain them away. Right. Yeah. But I would say it has to do everything. It has to do with all those points that that Jesse mentioned. Yeah, and I would add to that only. I think it's useful to to mention this the cyclical nature, and that's a useful framing test, um, especially because you can see Junger as a boundary of taboo, you know, and he's always on that boundary. So you know that he would be if it's becoming more appropriate to to read and talk about Junger. Um, in Germany, when he he really was taboo um, for so long, and that you know, as Tess has mentioned, it was um, uh, you know because of his adjacency <laughs> to um, to the Nazi Party and to um, such taboo politics um, that it is the French who kind of shepherd his reputation through the Nachkrieg side, and um, I, I would also mention that. Um, he's taboo for all these political reasons that we keep mentioning, but as a stylist, you know, he, he remains um, influential and widely admired. Um, and I think that in France, you know, Junger is also um, influenced by, you know, French symbolists or French decadence. Um, and so precedents in Mallarmé or Huisman um, are, um, there's a connection between Junger and, and these precedents. And so I think that, that there's also, that also helps to explain perhaps some of the French interest. Um, I see. In so he's not, he's not totally foreign to the French. He makes, he actually makes sense in the French literary tradition as well. There's in, in a corner there. of the French literary tradition, I think that, um, you know, and, and Tess probably also has more to say on this. I, I think that there is, um, you know, some shared connection there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and so when he when he was stationed in in Paris uh, between 41 and 44, he associated with a lot of, of, you know, characters, some who claimed they were in inner immigration and some who, who were um, maybe collaborating. It wasn't quite sure, but he drew the line. He did not associate with the hardline um, nationalists and the, the right wing extremists and the anti-Semites. He really, he, you know, Brasillac and all the rest, he did not. Um, he, yeah, you know, he found he, a Celine distasteful, right? Yeah. 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 Which again, who, who was rooting for, yeah, I guess, I don't know how many fans he had, but that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, so it's interesting uh, going back to, to how you opened up the, the conversation, Brad, with them. Um, with the Marble Cliffs being billed as the first anti-Nazi literary work in Germany, um, when when Jünger was 
confronted with these claims or with this praise, he said, no, 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 you know, my, this could apply just as well to Stalin or Bismarck. It's a novel that fits many feet. Mm -hmm. And so he, he's always careful to leave himself uh, ways out. And so there was talk of, you know, um, Goebbels and Goering wanted the, the novel banned because they appear is sort of in caricature form in some of the in some of the characters, but because Hitler was such a fan of of uh, Younger's early work, he said, "No, no, let Younger be." But right. again, you see that ten whatever four years later, when he's in France and he's in the salons with the you know the the painters and the writers and so forth, um, he was associating with with Jean Cocteau, one of them, and Cocteau. Uh, Talking about Jünger equipped, you know, some people had dirty hands, some had clean hands, but Jünger had no hands. I mean, you <laughs> never knew where he fit. He wasn't yeah, outright yeah. complicit, mm. but he also wasn't a resistor. Yeah, he was very well, fine at dodging or just at tiptoeing along the line and never stepping over one way or another. There's there's something interesting in, in that, not to justify it or anything, but just a note that that's a that's a very strikes me as a very survivor mentality during chaotic times like everything is uncertain you don't know who's running what and how do you get through that well you step very carefully right you never become too easy to put into any one category and then maybe when the dust settles you will have managed to get by through it by the skin of your teeth right and he did manage to do that so yeah. that war was not decided when it started no, that, well, that's that true thing too, was right? it was up in the air. So yeah, yeah. I'm I'm seconding what you just said. Yeah, very sophisticated yeah. man. Yeah, mm -hmm. very very interesting. And then lives to be a hundred, and you know, lives to be a hundred. What, hundred and two, hundred and four, hundred and two. Yeah, very. <laughs> it's just it's so wild to think about this guy listening to David Bowie or something. <laughs> do you know? Right. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's, it's, or, or hanging out with Abby Hoffman and, and yeah. Hopefully. Right. Yeah. He did. Yeah. So, so one thing we didn't touch on too much in our main episode was his travels. We sort of just noted he traveled very widely. And this is one thing I, I was trying to figure out just you know, part of the reason we do the show is we're trying to figure out who these people are when we cover a subject, right? Just, just get, let's get a little bit past the the work itself, talk about the work, but get a little bit into what makes them tick. Um, and always with the assumption that there's a little bit more going on than at the surface. And I was just fascinated by this man who has a, you know, I think fundamentally what we would call a conservative mentality. And yet he's got like, He's unbelievably open to travel, to doing all of the drugs and not in a it doesn't appear to be doing drugs in a sort of uh, an escapist mentality, though. Maybe there is some of that, but re genuinely in a almost in the way he collected insects was like, oh, there's this. Oh, you can do LSD. Well, let's see what that's about. And you can you can go to oh, you can go to uh, Malaysia. Well, let's go see what Malaysia is about. And I, I I'm struggling maybe not struggling but but i just found it very curious that he's he's on the one hand uh, you know you could almost describe him as a sort of politically sort of stuffy sort of contrarian sort of against a any movement at all and then on the other hand he's sort of trying to collect an encyclopedia of the human experience or something i i don't know if that strikes anybody else but i i think that i think to me that's what makes him interesting as a figure yeah. just you can't really pin him down because he sort of moves every time you do and maybe that's the chameleon like nature that we're talking about too during during the war um, yeah i i think that's a useful I don't, I don't know if it's an apparent contradiction, but it's a useful framing, you know, on the one hand, being so open to collecting new experiences and almost um, that being a, a, that sense of collecting new experiences, that sense of adventure being a driving motivator in Jünger's life. Um, you know, he, I think we haven't mentioned yet, he, even before World War I, he quit school to go join the French Foreign Legion in Africa in search mm -hmm. of adventure. And it is primarily a search of adventure um, that, that motivates him to do that um, and to see the and world. The, the Wandervogel stuff as well, too, as he was wandering around in the woods with his uh, sort of proto... This is an interesting group, right? The, they're, I don't really understand them that well, but he was part of the Wandervogel, which was like national... It felt like a nationalist Boy Scout hippie 
group. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and in, in the after the war, you know, becomes famous for more diaries, um, his travel diaries. You know, he mm-hmm. sees Haley's Comet for the second time in Malaysia. Um, and and then you're, you're contrasting this to a conservative mindset. Right. And, mm-hmm. and I think this is useful because it illuminates, um, you know, is, is, is Junger a conservative at the same time as we say, you know, he is all, he has many things at once. He's also a mystic. Um, and he, is he conservative or is he anti-liberal? You know, it's kind of both, but where are we placing the, the accent here? And I would say that the, the more enduring trait is um, a kind of anti-liberal um, sen- sensibility. Um, but I think on an even broader scale, to me, it brings up this, this difference between um, private experience and public experience, or do you prioritize um, is, is the goal, is, is your um, conception of the good life and what makes um, for um, character uh, defined by private experience and the perfection and expansion of private experience versus, to me, we can see as Junger as having a very limited imagination, really, for what public life and public experience is um you know in in that in a way that he is kind of you know anti-liberal he doesn't really he doesn't fit into democracy he's not that interested in um you know what a a public life under a a modern state looks like and how we interact with each other in that way and i think in every sense he is prioritizing then inner experience his second book is called war is inner experience Um, he's interested in how extreme experiences brushes with death um, travels to uh, new and and distant and exotic places um, expand um, the you know magical inner life that that uh, someone inhabits and I think that this is really how he was thinking of even in his political projects um, you know a kind of almost like a pre-modern idea of an an older version of 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 Germany where um, you know. Each and, and as Tess was saying, you know, each man should, um, you know, fulfill his duties and his obligations and perfect himself from the inside, and then we will have a healthy society. So I think mm-hmm. that 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 um, contrast that you're bringing up points to really interesting. Um, it points to a kind of worldview that is reflected through a different political tastes at this mm. time. Can I interject interject a couple of things? Um, as you were you were speaking there, uh, Jesse, I was reminded of a video of him where he has uh, his German soldier helmet, which has more metal around the sides. It's a larger helmet, and he had the helmet of an English soldier, uh, who, who and it was a smaller helmet, and that soldier died uh, precisely because the helmet was an inch smaller. Mm-hmm. So just this acute awareness of mortality. Uh, to a degree that I, I personally could can't relate to um, directly, right. I can imagine. Um, I just I just was reminded of that. the The second question I have is, or the, the question I have is about Hesse. Did he did he owe any uh, you know of his own? I guess his style or is that? Did he read Hesse? Or did they ever meet? Uh, do we know? I'm sure he read Hesse, but they they seem like contradictory mm-hmm. um, sensibilities to me. I don't yeah. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. To. Yeah. Um, you know, especially since you know Hesse was not involved in the in the whole war effort. He was managed to stay out of that fray. But but an important point about this the brushes with death and the and the inner experience versus the outer experience, one of the main sort of guiding factors in his explorations with drugs, he wrote in in this book, Rauschen or Intoxication, was to find that euphoria, you know, that that immediacy um, that he felt that he experienced on the battlefield. He wanted that intoxication so he wasn't interested in drugs that would you know sort of start the more sedative kinds he was more interested in the ones that would bring him that sense of being fully alive that he had 
Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. which actually cor- makes him so he corresponds with uh, another figure we've covered who's completely different. I think people would generally say completely different. Terrence McKenna was basically I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him, but but a complete opposite end of the spectrum on almost any issue you want to name, but who was very much about drugs are um, the felt about getting the felt presence of genuine experience, which strikes me as something that Junger is interested in, though perhaps finding it in drugs as well, but also in these in these this variety of other uh, on the battlefield. And yeah. you know, where McKenna was never going to be on the battlefield for a second. But um, that's what's inter- that's that's the thing that I found so captivating doing this research about Junger is just like as soon as as soon as I feel like I'm getting to know him, I encounter some other aspect. And then they're like, oh, well, then he's sort of thinking like this person who is completely different. <laughs> mm. and, yeah. and I actually think on the Marble Cliffs um, I, reminds me of a, a favorite book of ours on this show is uh, The Glass Bead Game. And uh, mostly because yeah, we will. Of, mm-hmm. Yeah, the, so, the sort of central metaphor of the game itself yeah. Um, and that feels like a game that Yunga would have played reasonably well if it were a real game. <laughs> I, <laughs> Just... Yeah, I, I think there's, I think there's definitely a shared sensibility be some, between something like the Glass Bead game and, um, and, and on the Marble Cliffs. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, and I was thinking too as, as Tess was speaking. Um, I've just kind of like rarefied, like not not just rarefied experience, right? And and doing something and and a sense for for refinement and and an interest in you know this this purity of um, not certainly of, of aesthetics, but but um, yeah, these these rarefied uh, tr- traditions and, and experiences. And and I think Tessa's point is also very well taken of. Um, you know, looking for these extremes and to recreate that that sense of being um, on the battlefield uh, through drugs, um, maybe not as related to the glass bead game. But I just wanted to add, I think that also relates to um, Junger's uh, suspicion of democracy um, and of, of all things sort of bourgeois, which if, if a, a bourgeois order um, and, and the liberal order uh, moves towards regulation and safety and and um, a more regulated experience of life that it really exists to prevent extremes, mm-hmm. right? Um, and to have a, a more regulated experience of of life and towards um, equality and more towards the middle of the road and security. Um, these things, I think, you know, at this point in our conversation, we can see how that all of that is totally anathema to what interests Junger um, uh, in being alive. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's just a certain core. Um not being not wanting to be told what to do at this at, as part yeah. of it right yeah. yeah they call it safetyism now safetyism <laughs> safety everything's gonna be safe very mm. safe yeah. yeah yeah zero mm. zero a zero risk environment which is you know not quite attainable anyway um yeah uh you know i want to we're, we're kind of closing in on the end of the first hour here i want to uh, start a bit of a conversation that maybe we can continue in the after dark um, as and where can of, people get the after dark Brad patreon.com slash art of dark pod yes I got support it support the pod <laughs> yes please um, lots of fun stuff happening over there um, uh, is you know the one thing I found very interesting in um, reading uh, the forest passage um, and I know that's not on the marble cliffs, but I think there's there's hints of this uh, an earlier nascent version of the ideas he might de- later develop is the, the relationship that Jung had to to technology. Um, you know, I guess as part of progress in general. But you know, I get to thinking about there's there's an interview with him late in life where he says somebody asks him about computers and i don't remember if the context was you know would you ever use a computer or what and his 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 response was something along the lines of like i'm not interested in a machine that works like a human mind drugs are much better than that (laughs) and incredible yeah and i guess um what i what i'm curious about is do we think and this kind of maybe brings it to today's time. I, I'm wondering, I'm going to phrase this like a question, but it's maybe it's just me saying what I think. More more of a comment than a question, actually. <laughs> is, um, is there a chance that 
you know, we talk about there's all these different aspects of Yunga that that, um, you know, there's seeming contradictions. Maybe they're not actually contradictions, but but the cyclical nature of the attention on him and, you know, a part of his work or thinking could come to the fore at a different time based on trends and people's anxieties. And I do wonder now if, you know, as things like AI, people are starting to recognize that the, the, the social media has got, it is got its uh, downsides, which might be larger than its upsides. If that could lead to a reappraisal of that aspect of Yunga, like, He's a guy who might be able to um, elucidate for us the downside of all of this technological progress, if progress is even the right word, right? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'm just kind of tossing that nope. out there and seeing if people. Have I think that, that I think that's a fabulous uh, question. In fact, yeah. and it, it, I'm ra- uh, racking my brain, and a lot of the big drug figures became very enamored of technology. I think yeah. McKenna was yeah. certainly Leary was, and here we have this figure um, from a from a different language, not from from English, but obviously translated, and he he didn't, but right. he was very into the drugs. So yeah, that's right. a, that's an interesting point, um, Brad. Yeah. Y'all have any See, thoughts on that? <laughs> Just Yunga and technology. What can is there mm. something we can learn from in that, I guess? Mm. Is there, or does anybody have any thoughts on that relationship? Um and if not, I could talk more. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think Junger would certainly have a, you know, I told you so moment with a lot of these, you know, sorts of things. I think he'd be very I think that, that um is probably one of his preferred mm-hmm. <laughs> positions <laughs> so um but, but well, that's yeah. a very elitist position to begin with isn't it ah yeah. yes well i told you this was going to happen yeah mm. well you know jesse makes some good points in her introduction about a younger's conception of honor mm-hmm. and there's nothing about technology that ties in with these traditional ideas of honor and chivalry a machine is a machine. Technology mm-hmm. is technology. And whether it brings out the worst in people like social media or the best, say, life-saving technology, um, you know, he would probably revert to traditional codes of honor is what keeps the civilization or a society yeah. alive. And yeah, that's, that's what's important. That's interesting because, yeah, he he's very much against like the mechanization of the mechanization of war to him is a is a sort of a sign of the end times in some way. But but it's actually an interesting context to put thought experiments, right? Because you can, uh, you know, every I think everybody when they hear about an unmanned drone doing something in a warfare situation gets a little it feels a little even more uncomfortable than you might with the notion of combat to begin with. There's something there's something inhuman about it. That's even more inhuman than combat might be normally. But then, uh, you know, people see chat GPT and don't a lot of people don't get that same ick factor. Right. But there is it's there, too. Right. So, um, yeah, it makes the war war can be a sort of uh, just the environment to put these questions about what's what's uh, what's what's what is honor? Uh, um, What is is honor an outmoded concept or can we, is there something in it that we should be trying to hang on to? And, and um, we're, I, at least I, I don't know about Kevin, I'm pretty anti chat GPT. So mm. any people who are smarter than me, if I can leverage their arguments in my ongoing, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a, an, a it long out. discussion yeah we're gonna be <laughs> wrestling with this stuff for a long time and yeah. increasingly we're reaching a point where almost anything um except for a few rare examples that has been written or said about this stuff will be uh rendered um if not irrelevant then sort of um not adequate to describe the the reality that we're all careening into together. <laughs> so it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. We we live in very interesting times. I've loved this chat. And of course, we're going to come yeah. back on the Patreon um, on the After Dark, patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. We're going to have more discussion about Yunga on the Marble Cliffs with uh, yeah. Jesse and Tess. And Brad, you want to tease that a little bit? Well, yeah. Well, first, I want to give I didn't do uh, due diligence letting uh, mm. Jesse and Tess talk about a little bit of what else they've got mm. going on. Jesse, I know you've got yeah. a couple of novels. What can you tell us about what's the what's the hottest thing you've got going on? Like what would you want to tell people about and how can they find you? Uh yeah. Um so 
I have published two novels and um, I have a collection of stories that should come out um, in the next nine to 12 months. We're not sure yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, my my work, um, my, my two novels, The Visitors and uh, the exhibition of Persephone Q, um, I feel very influenced by uh, 19th and 20th century European literature um, and modernism. Um, mostly in um, that maybe contiguous project of how do you filter crisis discourse and a sense of political upheaval through individual stories, through, through um, individual idiosyncratic kind of voice-driven um, literature. And so I would say that um, I, I feel influenced by by that project and that sort of defines my, um, my style, my work. I, I think I... I differ from Junger, um, you know, maybe above all in my own um, political <laughs> um, uh, leanings. Um, but uh, also I would say to keep it short um, in my attachment to irony and humor um, as a primary mode of metabolizing um, uh, experiences of, um, of crisis. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And where can they, where can people find you if they, if you even want them finding you? I don't know. Everybody yeah, has if, a different... <laughs> if you want to, to find me, I, I am on the, I, I guess I'm, I'm on the internet. You can find my books um, where, you know, I more or less wherever books are sold. Um, uh, novels are out from Farrah Strauss and Giraud and, um, uh, and other stories, which also does a lot of literature and translation. Okay, great, great. And, and, and I'll okay, have okay. links to the the two websites in the show notes at the website. Mm -hmm. And cool. and Tess, I know you've got uh, you've got a tremendous backlog of work that you've translated. Some authors I'm familiar with, and some I'm not. I'm going to go poking around in there and see what interests me. But what what do you have going on right now? If there's anything that you want to talk about, I mean, I know this just came out, so this is probably the big thing. But what else can we look forward to from Tess? I, I just finished um, a collection of essays by Montaigne, which has been immensely refreshing, not just after Junger, uh, because it's such an immediate um, personal voice that he cultivates, um, but with irony and humor. It's also sort of an antidote to my anxiety about uh, the, the chat and AI, because there's mm -hmm. no way that a voice like Montaigne's can be replicated by a machine because it is so... Um, so idiosyncratic, so so um, unpredictable, contradictory, reveling in the contradiction, and really just so personal. So that oh. was that's it's been sustaining. Absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. we'll keep an eye out for that because yeah, I think as I think one of the reactions to this whole Chat GPT kind of thing that's happening, or the automation in general, is yeah, let's finding those voices that um, can't be encapsulated by it somewhat and and those people are out there very interesting yeah. we got an offer from some uh startup that uh claims they can translate all of our podcast episodes into multiple languages in our own voices uh so it can be distributed across languages and brad and i both said no, no way <laughs> <laughs> nope not right, happening right. so yeah, yeah. No, yeah was, quality that... controls a bit tricky in that case <laughs> yeah. well yeah, and, and the, it was mm. interesting they they provided a sample they they i believe right kevin where oh, it was I... like they showed it in english or something or they had a sample they linked mm. to it and it was it was surprisingly good like it Gracious. was English and then it was the same person's voice in Japanese. I right. Yeah. And it Oof. was like, that does sound like the exact same person talking. Um, unsettling. It <laughs> is going to get weirder and weirder. <laughs> this is a real pleasure and an honor. Uh, yeah. the, the very exciting work. And we're going to talk more on the on the after dark. Do you want what exactly are we going to get yeah, into? There, I, I don't have yeah. a, I don't have an exact thing. I mean, there's a okay. couple of things I want to talk about, though, that I think we can get to. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, about Jung's style and, and maybe mm -hmm. more about just apparently we have a thing for German language writers on this show that I didn't realize mm. until just recently. And so I'm just curious, maybe we could talk a little bit more about German, Jung is German. Um, mm. And, and um, I also want to talk about, I, uh, you know, if the, the problematic nature, to use that word of Jung, what are some other writers who might serve as a digestif? Who can we put? Uh, who can we uh, put Jung in next to um, that might be interesting for just a sort of an interesting juxtaposition? I know everybody in mm. here is fairly well read and things. It might just be an interesting conversation, and then we'll see where else it goes. Okay. Dynamite. Dot com slash art of dark pod. 
And thanks again for joining us. All right. We'll, we'll come back for the after dark. 